Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Abraham is the central figure in Fear and Trembling. Why is that the case? Because he illustrates for us what faith means, what its import is, not just for the religious person, but even for a philosophical perspective that is adequately open to it, as Kierkegaard depicts himself as being through his narrator here. And there's a lot of ways to get the story of Abraham wrong, as he will, will tell us by way of illustration. The question that is raised for us in the early parts of this work is, what do we have to do to adequately understand, as far as we can, the Abraham story? And Kierkegaard tells us that we have to put in work. We have to make some sort of commitment. It cannot be a merely, as he's going to call it a little bit later in the work, aesthetic attitude towards it. So this ties in with his remarks about the world of the spirit and the work that we have to do there. He says that the story of Abraham is remarkable in that it's always glorious, no matter how poorly it's understood, but here it's a matter of whether or not we're willing to work and be burdened. And he says that his current generation is unwilling to work, and yet they want to understand the story. He says, we glorify Abraham, but how we recite the whole story in cliches. So let's actually look at some of these cliches. That can be useful. The great thing was he loved God in such a way he was willing to offer him the best. That's true, but the best is a vague term. He says, mentally and orally, we homologize Isaac and the best, and the contemplator can smoke his pipe while cogitating, and the listener may stretch out his legs comfortably. What's the problem with that? Why not take in a story that way? Well, we're not getting at the real meat, the core of the story if we do that. We turn Abraham into this distant figure who had good intentions and we don't consider it really that closely. And we can do the same thing with all sorts of other religious figures as well, as we'll see in the first problemata, where Kierkegaard is going to use the same language to talk about, for example, Mary and Jesus. What's getting omitted? What is getting left out? What would be involved in the work that we have to put in? Kierkegaard tells us, in this preliminary expectoration that it's anxiety. So he says, what is omitted from Abraham's story is the anxiety. To money I have no ethical obligation, but to the son, the father has the highest and the holiest. So we forget about that and we talk and in the process of talking, interchange the two terms, Isaac and the best, and everything goes just fine. And then he says, okay, imagine a case of a guy who's sitting there in Sunday school or in the pews listening to a sermon about, about Abraham, and he says, oh, so Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac to God because Isaac was the best thing. I should have a child so I can go and sacrifice that child. That would, like, really get me in good with God. Or, uh, lucky me, I've already got a child. Let's go and do that. And, and if somebody said that, we would say, 
No, 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 no. You totally misunderstood the story, my friend. Don't do that. If you do it, you're a terrible person. You're a murderer. And Kierkegaard uh, says, we, we could um, have the most you know, profound, tragic, and comic misunderstanding. If the preacher would f- found out about this, he would muster his ecclesiastical dignity and shout, you despicable man, you scum of society, what devil has so possessed you that you want to murder your son? And the, the man could respond, well, wait a second, what about this Abraham story? So it should be an uncomfortable story for us. And if that's the case, we're already starting to put in some of the work. It's wanting to push away the discomfort and say, oh, you know, God was God never uh, really meant for Abraham to take it so serious. He was just testing his faith. Or we say, well, you know, in this one case, it was okay. We don't have any explanation for why that would be. But just don't murder anybody in other cases. We, we make the story superficial and we lose the real core that's available to us there. That should, in fact, place us in anxiety, as Kierkegaard is saying. Why? He's going to go on and tell us that there's a contradiction that should be staring us in the face involved in this story. This should not be a story that we tell to satisfy people's doubts or to dispel worries. This should be a story that we tell precisely because it problematizes faith, because it tells us that we don't understand things as well as we would like to think we do. And in this section, the preliminary expectoration, he only talks about anxiety. Later in the problemata, he's going to talk about anxiety, distress, and paradox as all being involved within this Abraham and Isaac story. He's choosing these terms for a good reason, and they're not all equivalent to each other. There are, you might say, three interconnected aspects of the same basic challenge or comportment that that we are facing. So why, why anxiety? He goes on and he says, there's a contradiction here, a fundamental contradiction, one that we can't argue away, one that we can't just resolve by saying, oh, just have faith and the contradiction is going to be taken care of. No, that would be rather circular because the contradiction stems from the very act of faith that the paradigmatic example of faith, that is Abraham, is presenting to us. So what is the contradiction? He says the ethical expression for what Abraham did, if we want to think about this in terms of not just morality, but in terms of the highest values that we can discuss and compare with each other, the the values that are commensurable, the entire range of the ethical. If we think about it in that way, Abraham is a murderer. Abraham intends or means to murder Isaac. The fact that he does so at the command of God doesn't actually make it better or make him not a murderer. In in some respects, it may, may even make it worse If I go and I murder my neighbor because my neighbor is a serial killer and will go out and kill again, that's a bad thing to murder somebody, but it could in fact be demanded of me ethically if the only way that I can stop this terrible person from committing more crimes is to kill him. Isaac is an innocent Isaac is the person that Abraham is supposed to love most. And he takes him, ties him down to an altar, and pulls out a knife, preparing to slit his throat. So from an ethical standpoint, Abraham is a murderer, and we shouldn't follow that example. 
we should say this is a terrible act. It would be terrible just as much as some parent drowning his or her child in a bathtub because they're poor and uh, in despair and think that life ahead of that child is just going to be suffering. It's just as terrible as somebody walking down the street and grabbing a person at random and slitting their throat. What about from the religious side? He goes on and he says, the religious expression of what Abraham is doing is that Abraham means to sacrifice Isaac. And what, what does sacrifice mean? It means that we, well, there's two ways to see it. One is sacrifice is merely an economy of I give so I get in exchange. That's the way that many ancient people and many modern people view sacrifice. I sacrifice for my child's welfare, working two jobs, saving as much as I can, not enjoying myself so I can send my child off to a good college so that I can hound my kid the rest of his or her life and say, where is my payoff? That's a very trivial notion of sacrifice. That is not a religious notion of sacrifice. That is a commercial notion of sacrifice. A religious notion of sacrifice, when it is genuinely religious and not just a means of commerce with whatever one takes to be the gods, involves taking what one has that is best, the first fruits, uh, an animal, uh, one's own passions that are leading one to violate the laws and destroying them, sacrificing them for something that is higher, to realize some sort of higher value, the covenant in this case with, with God, the relationship with God. Now there's a question, should Isaac be an object of sacrifice? Generally, for the, the biblical God? No. As a matter of fact, the neighboring peoples sometimes engaged in that sort of thing, and God says, don't do that sort of thing. But he tells Abraham to do that. So we have a contradiction here. He says, precisely in this contradiction is the anxiety that can make a person sleepless, and yet without this anxiety, Abraham is not who he is. Now, that is a great phrase. Abraham is not who he is without this anxiety. Abraham himself is not some dummy. He was actually a clan leader. He was able to you know, move from a civilized city existence out into the wilderness. He had some brains, this guy. He actually manages to argue with God and to bargain God down almost successfully, saving the city of Sodom from divine vengeance. So Abraham is actually a very intelligent person. He would have known about what was going on and that there's this moral and ethical quandary that he's in. And that would place him in anxiety. So without having anxiety in the story, we're losing sight of Abraham. But it should also place us in anxiety as well. That's part of the work of striving to understand the Abraham story. This should not just be something at a distance. This should be something that poses a problem for us. Now, a little bit later on, I'd mentioned that Kierkegaard is going to connect anxiety, distress, and paradox in the problemata. And he tells us that the paradox can be understood in several different ways. One is that the single individual places himself in an absolute relation to the absolute, and we'll talk about that at greater length later. But he says, we do not want to know anything about the anxiety, the distress, the paradox. We carry out an aesthetic flirtation with the result. It arrives just as unexpectedly, but also just as effortlessly as a prize in a lottery. And when we've heard the results, we've built ourselves up. We've edified ourselves. This is a way of misunderstanding the story. It may be helpful when thinking about this, about this anxiety, to consider the other stories, the other people who Abraham brings up 
rather, who Kierkegaard brings up in this, this account. So where else does this catchphrase, anxiety, distress, paradox, come up? He talks about Mary, the one who bears Jesus. A young woman who is inhabiting a society uh, where having a child out of wedlock could in fact get you killed. And God comes to her and says, hey, uh, you are going to bear this child. And she says, how's that going to happen? I haven't known any man. God says, I'll take care of it. And she says, yes, she assents. And then, of course, there's the happy story of Joseph marries her. And, you know, we have the Christmas crash. But if you think about what that was like at the time, that would have been incredibly anxiety provoking. That would have been incredibly distressful. There would have been a paradox, several paradoxes, perhaps even involved there. And Kierkegaard goes on and says, Mary bore the child wondrously. She did it after the manner of women. And such a time is one of anxiety, distress, and paradox. The angel was a ministering spirit, but he was not a meddlesome spirit who went to the other maidens in Israel and said, don't scorn Mary. The extraordinary is happening to her. The angel went only to Mary and no one could understand her. The Mary story can be understood like the Abraham story. He goes on as well and he says, about the stories in the gospel. He says, we're touched. We look back to those beautiful times. Sweet sentimental longing leads us to the goal of our desire to see Christ walking around in the promised land. We forget the anxiety, the distress, the paradox. Was it such a simple matter not to make a mistake? Was it not terrifying that this man walking around the others was God? Was it not terrifying to sit down to eat with him? Was it such an easy matter to become an apostle? So he's not saying that Jesus himself would have had the anxiety, distress, and paradox, although we do see that in the biblical uh, accounts, uh, at certain points he did, in fact, incur that. But think about the disciples making sense out of this guy who speaks with authority in such ways, who grew up as a carpenter's son in some backwater, you know, half Greek town. What would you do in that circumstance? So when we understand Abraham in this way, we're opening ourselves up to a possibility of getting a lot more out of the story. And we can relate it to our own lives where we may be encountering the anxiety, the distress, and the paradox.